So far as I can tell, oh, I should turn a mic on. So far as I can tell, there are only two people who actually saw the miracle at Jesus' baptism. I know that the, the way the story goes, it sounds like everybody's there and everyone sees it. But if, if you pay careful attention to the texts of all the Gospels, it looks a little something more like this. So John is out there doing this crazy thing, washing Jews with water in the wilderness, in the river that they crossed to enter the promised land on dry ground. He's now putting them back in that river. This is weird, and we'll talk about that. But he's out there doing this, and it's causing a stir. Because everybody thinks he's a prophet. And, and in, it, as if it were not enough, he's basically saying, I am a prophet by what he's wearing. Being dressed in camel's hair is kind of saying, I am in the, the train of Elijah. I do stuff like Elijah does. So he's making this claim himself. He's saying, I'm a prophet. And there's a bunch of people going out to, again, Jews, to be washed in this water by him. And he says, this is to prepare you. You are now, by coming here to this water, admitting that you're a wretch. Admitting that you are sinister. Admitting that you are not the good person you've tried to be. Sure, you've tried. That's fine. But you've failed. You're admitting that you're a sinner. And you're saying that you can do nothing about it. So come into this water, and I will tell you that there is forgiveness coming. It's not in this water. There is no actual forgiveness in the water of John's baptism, but another is coming. One who is mightier than I. One who is so much more valuable and glorious than I that I don't have the right to crawl to him on my face and undo the laces on his shoes. And that, that's actually a bit clean because you've got to imagine the sandals of the people of those days were cleaner than the laces on our shoes today. Walking in the dirt and the mud, never getting a bath. I am not worthy to kiss this man's feet, but he's coming. And people are, they're eating this up, right? I, I know that there's like a big swing in culture today, especially Christian culture. It's this whole, you'll catch more with honey than with vinegar thing. Don't preach wrath. Don't talk about sin. Don't do that fire and brimstone stuff. It won't work kind of funny though if you think back and you look at the the swing of american culture it's really about the time we stopped preaching fire and brimstone that the whole loss of christianity and culture happened it's been a hundred years or so of slow decline but it really came about as a, a pulling back of the wrath and i'm not saying christianity is about wrath it's not <laughs> it's about grace but grace without something to forgive is pretty tame stuff yeah the sunshine on the hills is nice yay but it's not a reason to go to a place week in and week out, and much less put money in the plate. But law and gospel, wrath and forgiveness, sin and a savior, that's a different thing altogether. And John's preaching that. He's preaching the wrath. He's bringing the fire and the brimstone, and the people are coming out in droves. And then, as this line of people, this crowd of people, one after one, is coming into the Jordan River with him, and he's, is he dunking them? Is he pouring over them? We don't know. The text doesn't say. Your Baptist friends will insist he has to be being dunked. It doesn't really matter. Water is what matters. As he's putting water on all of them one at a time in some way, suddenly there stands before him his cousin. Whether or not he knew it was his cousin at this point, we don't know. But we do know he knows who this guy is. And he says to him, and this is in the Mark's gospel, this is from one of the other gospels, but he says to him, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm here to prepare them for you. So what on earth, what in heaven and hell are you doing? Asking me, who is not worthy, to kiss your feet, to baptize you into repentance. You're the only one that has no need of repenting, ever, at least so far as I understand it. What are you doing? Jesus is like, shh, <laughs> do it. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you why. We've got to do it. So John does it. He baptizes Jesus. And then this event happens, right? Where the sky bursts open. 
And the, the greatest glory of all heaven is seen and heard. And, and out of it comes the Holy Spirit in, in physical form. Spirits don't take physical form, but he does. And then it's a, a dove, which is actually just a white pigeon, which is kind of weird too. Why would he be a white pigeon? But he comes down and he lands on Jesus and, and he never says he leaves. I don't think Jesus walks around with a pigeon on his shoulder the whole time. But, but the point is, the Spirit never leaves Jesus. They always work together from this point on. And then again, God says from heaven, this is my son. Or, as Mark says, you are my son. And this is one of the weird things. Some gospels say he says, this is my son. Some gospels say he says, you are my son. The liberal says, see, there's mistakes in the Bible. I say, maybe God did both at the same time. You know, at Pentecost, the apostles were able to speak in one language and be heard in another. So I really don't think it's beyond the almighty God who made the heavens and earth out of nothing by speaking to speak and have Jesus here, you are my son. And here, have John here, this is my son. And the point is the same. The point is straight together. Jesus is the son of God, with whom God himself, the Father, is indeed pleased. And he's pleased by this baptism too, which is important. But now, what about everybody else? They didn't see that. They didn't hear that. They thought that it thundered. They thought it was just noise. So what is going on? Why is this happening? And the reason for this is, is very simple. This is so that John, who is the forerunner sent to proclaim Jesus, will now have absolutely no doubt. He will say in other places that he was sent in order to see a sign and give witness to that sign. And this is the sign. As the dove rests upon Jesus, now John can go to his own disciples, as he will in John's gospel, and say, there he goes, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven and land upon him. He is God's Christ. He is God's anointed. Don't follow me anymore. Follow him. And two guys, Peter and John, will actually go running right off. They've been following John the Baptist, and now they go and say, Lord, Jesus, where are you staying? May we follow you. What is the purpose of all of this? There's a lot going on. I mean, we don't have time possibly to get into the depths of all that baptism is, which is really bound up initially here. But the long and short you really want to take away most from what I've said so far is the purpose of this is to provide two witnesses to who Jesus is. In Hebrew Levitical law, nothing could be taken as true unless it was established in the mouth of two witnesses. And the purpose of this is to keep some guy from coming along and making stuff up and everybody listening to it, right? I saw heaven descend on me like a dove, and I'm God. Well, who says? I do. God spoke to me. Well, are you sure, sir? <laughs> yeah, two witnesses. And so now there is one who testifies about Jesus besides Jesus. This is John. John, who fulfills the old prophecies that Elijah would come again to prepare the way to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that when Jesus comes preaching sin and forgiveness, even the Jews, who have the blood of Abraham running in their veins, might be able to admit that that's not enough to help them rise from the dead. Now, I don't know how much I've really given you Mark's take on this, and I don't know that I'm going to go deep into it, but you do got to kind of take a step back and see that the four Gospels, and I kind of, we got into this a little bit with the you and the, and the this is that I was talking about a moment ago, but the four Gospels, they all tell the same history. None of them tell a different fact of what happened in the past, but they all tell it from four different perspectives. So if I were to hold this book up to you, and you'd never seen it before, and I say, please describe this book. You're going to describe a, a maroon book with some engraving on the front. It looks like a book and a shell and a cup of some kind. But there's also an engraving with some gold on it. There's a cross and it says St. Paul's Lutheran Church down here. Now, if I held it this way and asked you to describe it, you'd get very close to describing the same book. It's a maroon book, yeah? And it even has some embossing on it. It's got a, a hand and a cross and a dove. But see, you just described a different thing. But it's the same book. But it's a different thing, but it's the same book, right? That's the way the gospel writers are working. They are all talking about the same history, 
but they're looking at it from a different angle. And it's not just about Mark saw this and Matthew saw that. It's even better than that. It's that Mark remembers this and wants to have you remember it in such a way that it points you to this final truth. Luke researched everything and found these things, and these pieces help you understand this thing that he wants to get you to see. And those kind of ultimate points are, well, well, they're different. They're the angle that they're taking. And so, for example, in Luke's gospel, he emphasizes the priesthood of Jesus and the prophetship of Jesus and the kingship of Jesus. And in Matthew, he really emphasizes the Judaism of Jesus. In Mark, he emphasizes the authority of Jesus, the terrifying, bizarre nature of him as a human man. He does, Jesus does weird stuff in in Mark's gospel. He's angry for no reason. He acts like a, a man possessed by a spirit, which, how's the book start? Just did. He is possessed by a spirit. So all of these angles are giving you kind of a different edge of what is true about our Lord so that you have a total or a fuller picture. You wouldn't need other gospels if you didn't have these different angles to look at. Now, like I said, I don't want to get too far into Mark. I'm sure if things fall into place and I end up with you in the future, we'll get deep in Mark. The rest of this year has got plenty of Mark in it. But what I want to also not forget about today is what today is. Again, the baptism of our Lord, but also the day after Epiphany. Epiphany is like the lost holiday in Christianity. Epiphany and Ascension, both of them, really. I could say the Annunciation, too, and I'm getting off on a tangent. But Epiphany used to be the, if not one of, the biggest holidays in Christianity. It was way bigger than Christmas. They called it something different, though. They called it Twelfth Night. You may have heard of that before. In fact, there's even a Shakespeare play called Twelfth Night, which was written for Twelfth Night. Go figure. Twelfth night, as in the night of the twelfth day of Christmas. There's also a song, right? The twelve days of Christmas. It's all about a bunch of weird stuff that doesn't make a lot of sense. We sing it over and over again. But it all flows out of this deeper history of the church's calendar. The church's calendar exists to be a confession, a teaching, a proclamation, and a preaching of Jesus. So that if you get a pastor who doesn't know what he's doing, you can still learn from what's going on around you in the liturgy. And what's going on around you in the liturgy is we have moved through Advent, the proclamation that wrath and the end of the world is coming, to a remembering of the incarnation of Jesus, which saves you from it, right? Through Advent to Christmas. But Christmas doesn't end with Jesus being born, nor does his life end with him being born. Rather, it keeps moving forward toward Golgotha, toward the cross. And the whole rest of the the season of the church here now, excuse me, up until Easter, is about really moving toward that cross. So for these 12 days of Christmas, we kind of dwell in the majesty of Jesus being flesh, that God himself is now here among us. And so if we had services every day, which I promise I'll never try to make that happen, but if we did, you would have white every day, all the way up until this white day of of baptism. But the peak of it, the peak of those every days, these 12 days of Christmas leading up to, is not the baptism of our Lord, but the epiphany of our Lord, which yesterday again celebrates what? The wise men, the magi, these bizarre pagans from far off lands, coming to recognize that Jesus is not just the king of the Jews, but that he is in fact the king of the entire world, born God-man to save us from our sin. Now, why is this important? It's actually bigger than his incarnation. His incarnation, Christmas, it's a big deal. But it could be taken to mean that it's only for the Jews. Here is the son of David to reign on David's throne. He's going to conquer the world in David's name. Everything's going to be good, but it's better for the Jews than for you. Because they're part of the tribe, and you're not. But see, epiphany is the revelation, and that's what the word means. The revelation, the pulling back, the unveiling of the fact that Jesus didn't come just to be king of the Jews. Or just to, to make them rise above everybody else. He came for you, too. And this is why the, the Magi, they are not the best example of humanity coming to to worship Jesus. These guys are wrong. These guys are backwards. How do they find him? They're stargazing. They're astrologers. They're pagans. They're looking at the horoscope. I mean, it's just, it's so backwards. The word magi is where we get our root word magic from. These are magicians. 
These are not Christians. But they accidentally, by means of their paganism, find their way to Herod's house. And in Herod's house, believing that some king of the world is coming in some backwards way, they have God do something miraculous. God gives them his word. Herod, who doesn't want this king to come, asks the priests, who also later will very much demonstrate they don't want this king to come, where is the king going to come from? And they go back to the scriptures. And they open it up and they find where it says, in Bethlehem he will be born. And they give that word of God to these magicians. And what do they do? They believe it. They believe it. And only then does the star lead them further on to Bethlehem where they find the child. And does God reveal to them in dreams, look, don't go back to Herod. All the the mystery of that, though, it hinges on the word proclaimed comes to them to save them. Now, Epiphany is the moment where we also celebrate that that same word, not the star, not the stargazing, not the dreams, but the proclamation has come to you, too. That you belong here, in this place. That you belong as one with Jesus. And now that brings us back to how did that happen? You're proclaimed, it's declared, but where does it actually get given? Baptism. The entry point to the mystery and the eternity of God. That indeed Jesus later will take John's baptism and make it his own. Leaving behind the fact that it's just plain water and doing something far more miraculous. Putting into it fire and spirit. That is wrath and life. Yeah, death and resurrection as Paul talked about in Romans chapter 6 this morning. Now to close... I want to point you to the the way Luther describes this entire miraculous reality in that hymn we just sang. This is a hymn that, that hung unsung in many Lutheran churches for many years because Luther's hymns don't always have the easiest tunes. Once you learn their tunes, they're pretty good, but they're all based on medieval chants, and so they get a little movie, kind of weird. You're not expecting them. But this is a new tune with this hymnal that came out. If you flip back from 407 to 406, you'll see the same hymn is there with the old tune. But anyway, it it lay hidden for so long, and it's a travesty because it's just such a beautiful text. So I'm going to read it here. I'm not going to comment much, maybe just a little bit, but I want to read it. I want you to hear the poetry. I want you to hear how he moves from this miracle of Jesus who came for you, Gentile, you pagan, you sinner, To be baptized in your baptism, the one you needed to have done, the repentance, the destruction, the death, which is the cross, and then goes and gives what he has achieved to you. To Jordan came the Christ, our Lord, to do his Father's pleasure. Baptized by John, the Father's word was given us to treasure. This heavenly washing now shall be a cleansing from transgression, and by his blood and agony, Release from death's oppression. A new life now awaits us. Oh, hear and mark the message well, for God himself has spoken. Let faith, not doubt, among us dwell. And so receive this token. The token is baptism. Yeah? Our Lord here with his word endows pure water freely flowing. God's Holy Spirit here, baptism, avows our kinship while bestowing the baptism of his blessing. The Spirit vows that we are brothers with Christ now, that we are bound to Christ now. These truths on Jordan's banks were shown by mighty word and wonder. The Father's voice from heaven came down, which we now do well to ponder. This man is my beloved Son, in whom my heart has pleasure. Him you must hear. And him alone, and trust in fullest measure the word that he has spoken. Which word? Well, all of them, but which word? That you're baptized into his death and resurrection. That what he has done has been done for you. More of the history. There stood the Son of God in love, his grace to us extending. The Holy Spirit, like a dove, upon the scene descending. The triune God, right? Father, Son, and Spirit, all there together, assuring us with promises compelling that in our baptism he will thus among us find a dwelling to comfort and sustain us. Now he jumps to the end of Matthew's gospel. 
To his disciples spoke the Lord. Go out to every nation and bring to them the living word and this, my invitation. Let everyone abandon sin and come in true contrition to be baptized and thereby in baptism win full pardon and remission and heavenly bliss inherit. Here's your fire and brimstone next. But woe to those who cast aside this grace so freely given. They shall in sin and shame abide and to despair be driven. For born in sin, their works must fail. Their striving saves them never. Their pious acts do not avail. And they are lost forever. Eternal death, their portion. (laughs) Some heavy law right there. But for you, for you, baptism, all that the mortal eye beholds is water as we pour it. No doubt, absolutely true, just looks like water. Before the eye of faith unfolds the power of Jesus' merit. Because the word has said this is the blood of Jesus being poured over your body to cleanse you forever, even though it looks like just water, you believe it is so much more. For here, faith is it. Here, the faith sees the crimson flood to all our ills brings healing. The wonders of his precious blood, the love of God revealing, assuring his own pardon of you. In the name of Jesus, amen.